Okay, so maybe we can get started, John. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to do, introduce Dr. David Wong and his resident team today, who are going to present uh, some interesting cases in his field. Uh, Dr. Wong is, of course, an assistant professor here in Toronto, where he's on staff at St. Mike's as the ophthalmologist in chief, as well as uh, Oakville Trafalgar, which I didn't even know, and uh, Trillium. Um, he uh, <clears throat> graduated from U of T. He did his residency here, as well as uh, a fellowship both here in Retina and at Columbia University in New York. I was interested to read that he's on the board of directors for the 2020 NSERC Ophthalmic Materials Network, um, which sounds very interesting. And he's also consultant to several companies in the industry. And I know David has had uh, quite, a, quite a long interest in uh, uh, ophthalmic and retinal technology. Uh, <clears throat> he's of course uh, written many papers and spoken at many, many meetings internationally and nationally. And his research interests include improving diabetic retinopathy surveillance and uh, of course new ophthalmic biomaterials. So welcome to Dr. Wong, uh, as well as uh, Atom and Safwan, our resident presenters today. Thank you very much. Good morning. <clears throat> Atom, you can start? Yeah, sure. I'm going to share my screen right now. Well, Adam sharing his screen, I'll just remind uh, all the staff faculty that we have, uh, this is the annual general meeting for our section, um, EPSO. Uh, the meeting is uh, tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., Saturday morning. Um, you need to register through EPSO if you haven't already to be sent the link. I'll remind everybody again at the end of the session. Okay, so can you see my screen? Yes, it looks good, Adam. Okay, so good morning, everyone. My name is Hatim. I'm one of the uh, BGY4 residents. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Wong for sharing this very interesting case. A 50-year-old male patient presented with one-week history of left eye pain, redness, and severe headaches. He had poor vision in both eyes at baseline, and uh, vascular history was significant for microphthalmia, congenital cataract, also, he had cataract surgery at age of two years and he was left FAK to import eyes, then developed early onset glaucoma and the pressure was controlled with drops. And also he had long standing corneal edema. Past macular history was unremarkable and he was taking cause of alpagan and latanoprost. On examination, the vision in the right eye was 2100, in the left eye was counting finger, and he had surgical pupils in both eyes. The pressure was 18 in the right eye and 52 in the left eye. And as you see here in the pictures, in the left eye, he had a very diffuse conge injection with very significant corneal edema. And the AC was deep, and there was a white fluffy material in the AC, likely retained lens fragments in both eyes. Dilated fundus exam in the right eye was unremarkable and in the left eye actually there was no view but the B-scan showed no retinal detachment. So based on this clinical presentation the likely diagnosis was lens particle or phacoantigenic glaucoma in the left eye and now we're gonna launch the first poll. How would you manage this patient? And we'll give the audience a few seconds to respond. So you're going to do just drops or a diamox, topical steroid, surgical removal, or all the above. Yeah, I'll just give it a couple more seconds and then we'll end the poll. Yep, so most of the audience picked the right answer, which is all of, above, all of the above in such cases. So, Hadam, before you move on, um, it wasn't so obvious at the beginning that this is necessarily what it was. The, a lot of these patients do have residual material in their eye. Um, there was some debate at the beginning as to, you know, whether this was old or new. Any ideas uh, what, what was the clue that this wasn't just old Elchnick pearls or other, you know, summerings ring type material in the periphery? So I think the first thing is the uh, inflammation. When you see this kind of inflammation and uh, when you see like the sudden increase of the intraocular pressure, so you think about something very uh, acute. Uh, 
but uh, again, the patient in the past, he had like early onset glaucoma and was very controlled with the, uh, inter with the uh, glaucoma drops. So this is something maybe acute and chronic. Yeah, the other thing was that the material didn't look you know, sort of clear and whitish and pearlish. It was very fluffy, much like when you do a phaco and leave something behind in the anterior chamber and it just sort of fluffs up. Yep. Okay, good, thanks. Okay, just gonna keep going. So uh, this is what happened. Actually, the patient was started on topical steroid, glaucoma drops and oral diamox. However, the intraocular pressure remained high despite of uh, maximum medical treatment. Giving no improvement with the medical therapy, this patient needed an urgent surgery to remove their retained lens fragments, but the cornea was very hazy and there was no posterior segment view. So now we're gonna launch the uh, second poll. What surgical intervention can be done next? and we'll give the audience a few seconds to respond. So we can do CBC or cornea transplant followed by lensectomy or combined BKB, vitrectomy, lensectomy with uh, temporary uh, KB or endoscopic vitrectomy with lensectomy. Okay, I'll give it a couple more seconds and then we'll end the poll. Okay, so the audience is split between option three and four. And given the urgency of this case with very significant corneal edema, Dr. Wong elected to proceed with the uh, endoscopic vitrectomy and lensectomy. And now I'm just gonna uh, stop sharing to uh, play the video. So just give me one second. I'm gonna share again now. Okay, can you see my video? Yes. So as you see here, the fluffy white material, which is like the retained uh, lens fragment, as any vitrectomy started with 23 gauge uh, trocars and chandelier. And here, Dr. Wong is doing the lensectomy. So he's removing the uh, lens material with the uh, catcher. And as you see, uh, Dr. Wong needed to indent the eye to get most of the uh, lens fragment. And the lens fragment was like very soft, fluffy and liquefied and was easily removed by a cutter. But some of the lens fragment actually went back to the posterior uh, segment. And here, as you see, the uh, visualization is very hazy. You barely can see the optic nerve because of the significant corneal edema. So we cannot use the microscope for vitrectomy. Here, Dr. Wong trying to scrape the cornea and see if that will improve the visualization, but unfortunately did not. And you can see maybe also there is like a cornea scar. So the decision was made to uh, proceed with endoscopic vitrectomy and he's just making a new scleotomy. And then a 20 gauge micro endoscope was inserted. And next, what you're seeing now is the uh, endoscope uh, monitor. Unfortunately, we uh, couldn't record like the uh, endoscopic vitrectomy with this uh, machine, but we just did like uh, external recording. And uh, sorry for the quality, but here, as you see, Dr. Wong was able to see the uh, posterior segment and trying to do a vitrectomy and maybe you can see some of the uh, lens fragment uh, floating in the uh, vitreous and Dr. Wong here, he did like a lensectomy and same time vitrectomy. And 
And after finishing the uh, vitrectomy and lensectomy, we, uh, Dr. Wong just uh, closed the uh, sclerotomy with uh, seven O vicryl and then closed the conge and removed the trocax. And this is the look of the eye like by the end of the surgery. So I'm just going to stop sharing again and go back to my presentation. Give me one second. Okay. So you can see my slide. Okay, so during the uh, follow-up visits, the patient actually was doing really well and the IOP was well controlled with the uh, glaucoma drops. But as you see here in the picture, the patient still has significant cornea edema and was referred to the cornea specialist for a uh, possible corneal transplant. The unique thing about uh, our case was the onset of lens particle glaucoma, which was many years after cataract surgery. And this clinical presentation has been reported previously in the uh, literature. And now just a quick overview about endoscopic vitrectomy. The current ophthalmic endoscopy system consists of microendoscope, central base unit, and two-dimensional video monitor. The base unit provides an illumination source and high-resolution video camera. And this diagram showing the ophthalmic fiber optic microendoscope. And as you see here in the diagram, at the tip of the endoscope, we have the objective lens system. Then there is a fiber optic image guide at the center of the endoscope that's surrounded by the optical fibers for illumination. And at the end of the endoscope, we have a camera sensor. In terms of visualization concept, as you see here in this picture, with the conventional microscope-based viewing system, the illumination and viewing are dissociated, and the light transmitted through the patient's anterior segment into the operating microscope. While with the endoscopy system, the illumination and viewing are coaxial, and the same uh, endoscope tip is the point at which both light emission and capture occur. That's why the transparent structures like vitreous and membranes appear more opaque and visible with coaxial uh, visualization as you see here in the picture. Another important concept is the intra-objective view. The conventional microscope-based system provides a top-down wide-angle uh, intra-objective view, while the endoscopy system provides an endoscopic side-on intra-objective view, which is 90 degrees apart, as you see here in these pictures. The main advantages of endoscopic ophthalmic surgery is bypassing anterior segment obesity, like what happened in our case. Also, it provides an easy access to anterior anatomic structure that cannot be seen by conventional microscope. What about the limitations? A major drawback of endoscopic system is the absence of stereopsis and dissociation of hand movement from image perception. Also, there are some limitations linked to the hardware itself. For example, small gauge endoscope has a narrow field of view and low resolution compared to larger gauge endoscope. Another major limitation is inability to perform bimanual surgery, given that the surgeon is holding the endoscope with one hand all the time during the surgery. And in case of significant corneal obesity, the view of posterior segment after surgery will be still limited. And we need like a B scan to uh, check the status of the retina. In terms of future directions, we need to develop a higher resolution images with smaller endoscope and improve the stereoscopic viewing system to provide better depth perception. Also incorporating a time image sensor in the endoscopy system to allow for real-time measurement of distance. 
And this table summarizes the major differences between the microscope system and the endoscopy system. We already talked about the illumination and visualization. And in terms of uh, field of view and resolution of the uh, microscope system, actually it depends on the optical performance of the uh, microscope. While in endoscopy system, it depends on the size of the endoscope and the number of optical fibers. And as you know, uh, stereopsis is always present with the uh, conventional microscope system and it's absent with the endoscopy system. Anterior limit peripheral view uh, in the endoscopy system, uh, visualization is up to the iris and ciliary body, but in the microscope based system, as you know, is up to the vitreous space. And sometimes you need to indent or press on the sclera to see the, uh, the aura. So finally, the uh, take home messages. First, lens particle glaucoma may occur many years after cataract surgery. And second, the endoscope system allows the circumvision of the media obesity and visualization of the intraocular structure that may not be seen with the current microscope based viewing system. And here is my references and thank you. Outstanding. Thank you. David, I congratulate you and a beautiful case and Hatem on presenting it very well. Does this mean there's really no further use for the Landers folks keratoprostheses? I mean, why not do it all at one time? You know, remove the cornea, put a Landers folks prosthesis so you could see the, um, the structures in, in 3D. And then at the end of the case, put back a corneal transplant, which you're going to have to do anyways. That's question one. Question two, when you were removing the lens fragments, were, what was the setting? Was it irrigation cut aspiration or irrigation aspiration cut? Um, so I'll just answer the second question first. We, just, we used a uh, vitrectomy cutter. So it's... it's so it'll be just cutting as it, it's just a typical uh, vitrectomy. You know, the material soft enough we can take it out. In fact, the new vitrectomy system, even with a hard lens, we can get that. So with a vitrectomy cutter, we can get all pretty much all lens material. Um, for the first question, it's a great, it's a, it's a really uh, a, an issue because you do think about that, and that's one of the reasons why endoscopy kind of started and then it fell off because we we went back to going as you said the, the temporary care prosthesis and then cornea transplant. But in this case, it was, it's, you know, your graft failure is going to be much higher and you, um, uh, with all these problems. Um, so we just try to see if we can sell it down. Second thing, and, and this has always been an issue, is trying to find coordinating two surgeons. Though I have done keratoprosthesis by myself, I try to put a cornea back on by myself. My suturing is not as good as, as yours, Alan. And so, um, you know, try to get a cornea surgeon. Uh, sometimes it can be difficult, so it's easier for us just to go in and just try to clear this up. Um, in this case, it, you could go either way. Some of the other ones, like trauma we've done, sometimes these eyes may not um, survive. Sometimes when you go in, you don't know. So we kind of try to say, well, can we get this thing stabilized before we uh, use the precious cornea tissue? At least those are the things we've been working on. Thank you. Beautiful case. Uh, the other reason, too, is... Um, uh, in this case, this is a, a nanophthalmic eye, from what I believe, uh, high risk for open sky complications, supercoidal hemorrhage, choroidals, etc. So um, we're, our plan is to do a DSEC. So if we went straight to the Landers folks, um, you know, we've got the risk of the open sky. The other issue too is, is white to white is quite small. So if you mm. were to uh, put the Landers folks lens on, it would probably go limbus to limbus. So uh, that, that would uh, preclude doing a PKP. So uh, a DSEC is in the plan for him in the future. Thank you. Great. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, but the Landers folks do come in a smaller size. They come in, I think the smallest is about a seven uh, millimeter, which, which work. But the beauty, as you say, you don't have to um, open the sky and subject the patient to other possible risk factors uh, in an inflamed eye anyways with a high pressure. So that certainly merits it. Um, there's a question in the chat, I think it was a good one. Um, it's, uh, the question was from Katie. 
why uh, why didn't we do uh, ECP um, uh, endocircular photocoagulation uh, distillery body destruction at the same time? And that's partly because you know if you can get these eyes hypotenuse afterwards. If, you, if we just got rid of the inflammation control on meds, um, and I've gone into situations where we actually made the eye hypotenuse with that, so I kind of try to stage it if I can. Great. Any other questions? All right, um, maybe go on to their second case. And, uh... Actually, just a quick question, David. I yep. think you're one of the few people that actually has one of these endoscopic um, setups. Is that correct? Uh, well, the, the interesting part, this was actually done with the KEI endoscope. I actually used the, I, had to, I did this case at KEI. And so um, we did have an endoscope system at St. Mike's. Uh, unfortunately, we were changing systems. I am in the process of getting a new system and actually we were kind of, tweaking a new one. So yeah, we are going back to doing endoscopy again. Um, all right. Maybe Safan? Sure. All right. Thanks, I think that was a very interesting case. So let me share my screen right now. All right, good morning, everyone. Again, I'm Safwan, one of the BGOA2s, and today I will be presenting an interesting case that was recently seen at St. Michael's Hospital. And before I begin my presentation, I truly would like to thank Dr. David Wong for his help in preparing this presentation over the last uh, couple of weeks. So um, our patient for today is a 56 years old gentleman. He is the typical kind of story that encountered every day at St. Michael's Hospital clinics, flashes and floaters in the left eye uh, for two days. He has a past ocular history of cataract extraction in both eyes around 10 years ago. His past medical history, medications and allergies all were um, unremarkable. So our patient had a visual acuity of 20-20 in the right eye and counting finger in the left eye. Uh, the slit lamp exam was completely unremarkable in both eyes, and the dilated fundus exam in the left eye actually showed trichomatogenous retinal detachment temporarily, uh, MAC off with um, retinal tear temporary at two o'clock location. And he was also found to find a concurrently full thickness macular hole. And here is an OCT and showing, uh, confirming the macular hole. And as you can see, it's like actually a fairly large size hole is that measure around six or three micrometers. And with that will come our first polling question. Uh, what treatment option would you choose for the repair of such a, a macular hole? We're gonna give the audience around um, 30 seconds. All right, I will end the poll there. All right, inter uh, all right. Uh, thanks everyone for participating. It's actually a tricky question because there is no right or wrong answer here. It's just, we were just uh, interested to see what people think and how people would proceed. Um, Dr. Wang in the group at Samikes actually uh, proceeded with vitrectomy and the use of um, neurosensor rate in a free flap. Um, and I'm gonna share the surgical video right now. Can you see my video moving? Yeah. Perfect. As we can see here, here's the temporary um, retinal detachment with the retinal tear. And here we see the full thickness macular hole. And now starting with the basics, just vitrectomy and removing the vitreous base. And here just marking the edge of the tear with endothermy. Now just shaving the vitreous off the edge of the tear. And now actually harvesting the flap from the edge of, uh, from the, edge of the retinal tear with forceps and scissor. And now just um, ICG to stain the inner limiting membrane. And now just basically grasping and peeling the ILM. Uh, 
And now uh, further like trimming uh, the flap just to perfectly match uh, the size of the macular hole using forceps and scissor. Now just basically just tucking the flap over the macular hole. No. And as we can see down here, the PFO bubble, and now we're just gonna, the eye gonna be rotated very slowly to have the PFO bubble over the, uh, the flap to stabilize the flap uh, nicely over the hole. And we see the flap is nicely set over the macular hole. And now just basically expanding and adding more PFO. And now just basically draining the subretinal fluid through the break. Now just an air fluid exchange. Now just removing the PFO. And now as the retina is nice and flat, just adding laser around the preferred break. All right, I hope you enjoyed the video. I'm then gonna reshare my uh, PowerPoint presentation. Just give me a second here. All right, in uh, post-operative day one, our patient has a visual acuity of counting finger and the retina was attached 360. Post-operative week one, the retina was still attached and we were able to uh, confirm that the macular hole is closed in exam. And um, when opera, post-operative month one, uh, we see the visual acuity has actually improved to 2400 and we were able to get an OCT, which showing how nicely uh, the graft is closing the macular hole. And, um, I found it actually very interesting that although that is what, as we saw in the video, it was a full thickness flap from the periphery. Now, actually the flap is actually assuming the contour of the foveal depression. And we can even like uh, here appreciate the beginning of the, re of the reconstitution of the ellipsoid zone. In a three month follow up, the visual acuity continued to improve to 2300 and the OCT, even now we see like more reconstitution of the ellipsoid zone um, and uh, the flap again, assuming the shape of the foveal depression and the OCT and you hear, um, even we can actually appreciate um, uh, early reperfusion of the graft. So uh, with that, I would just look, would like to go over this recent paper, which looked at um, um, the global practice of using autologous retinal transplant for the um, repair of primary micro hole or micro hole associated with retinal detachments. So it was a, a case series uh, multicenter that included 130 eyes that underwent autologous retinal transplant for the repair of either isolated micro holes or micro hole associated with retinal detachment. Uh, the main outcomes of this study were the closure rate, the visual acuity, the external limiting membrane and ellipsoid zone integrity and OCT. And the results actually were impressive. There was a very high closure rate, uh, around 89% in the macular hole group and 95% in the macular hole RD group. And the visual acuity have improved by at least three lines in 43% of the eyes and by five lines or more in 29% of the eyes. And as expected, uh, reconstitution of the um, ELM and ellipsoid zone on OCT was associated with uh, better visual outcomes. 
And the main complications were reported were just like a dislocation of the graft and post-operative RD in 3.8% of the eyes. And there were only one reported case of post-operative endophthalmitis. So uh, it was concluded that ART can achieve a good anatomical and functional outcome in the treatment of either isolated, a large and refractory primary microrohor or microrohor associated with retinal detachment. With that, thank you so much and we'd be happy to receive any questions and comments. Great, thank you very much, Safran. That was fantastic. David, that's a very elegant surgery and uh, I'm just amazed at the OCT and how the, uh, the retina has integrated uh, with the graft. In, in this case, you had a, a tear where you could harvest the, the tissue. Can you harvest tissue in uh, uh, retina that's, that's fully attached from the periphery and laser it? Or what's, what's done in this paper that you presented? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question, uh, Sharif. Um, so this one had a peripheral retinal break already. So I was uh, easy to, to take a, a piece of the retina. Um, in the macular holes that are large, uh, Tamer, maybe who really invented this surgery, uh, started taking from attached retina and would cut out a piece. And, and they've actually gotten very aggressive and it, it surprises me. And, and I was, we were, mo most of the retina community was very sitting back and saying, this is uh, really out in, in the far side, but he's shown fantastic results. As you can see, the, the graphs really do take, and he's actually getting closer and taking that from the superior nasal part of the retina, just a couple of disc diameters away and he'll, cut out a piece of that retina, attached retina, de detach it off, and then laser it off there. And yeah, it works uh, for these very large macular holes. So we have various techniques now for these large holes, and um, we're not sure which is the best approach, but this is one approach, uh, and I'm actually going to be doing probably more of these for these very large ones, because I'm fairly impressed what I see on this OCT. Um, I, I'm quite impressed with the, how this looks and in the response of, of this patient. And the patient's ecstatic. And there's some interesting data uh, that's now coming. These patients, even though their holes are closed, they, they, their scrotomas are much less. They, even though they may not fully see well, they're so happy because they got almost their uh, negative scrotoma is, is better, which is fantastic. So David, there's a question from uh, the chat about how do you maintain the orientation of that piece of retinal tissue? What, what, what if it's upside down or do you have to worry about that? Yeah, you do well. I, I think we do. Um, it's it's like planting things. Uh, you know, if planting a carrot upside down, it, it, it's a problem. Um, this one here was simple. I, I just held it. I knew which side it was. And I just held it in my left hand. And when you saw me peeling the the ICG, I was peeling with one hand and holding the flap in the other one. Um, the ones we've seen as well is, is when they take it off. They keep it underneath the plurf. They use the plurifilic carbon liquid and leave it there to keep the orientation. So they'll peel it off, uh, leave it on the side, uh, and have the plurifilic carbon liquid full all the way, and then drag it underneath. And so that's how they keep the orientation. Um, we have not heard so far of anybody uh, what the results are of when they flipped it upside down. But again, if we're just using it as a matrix to close, it's probably not as important. But if we're using it that there is some integration of neuro tissue, which is somewhat of a thought going on, which is very surprising. Um, it may be important. So. And how hard is it to prevent it from just scrolling up like a little ball or does it tend to stay unfolded? I know the, 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 the corneal ones kind of scroll up. <clears throat> it, yeah, it doesn't tend to scroll as much. Uh, the bigger ones will. This one was about a 600 micron, so it's a bit stiffer. Um, the other things we've done instead is also use amniotic membrane, and that tends to scroll quite a lot. Or when we use uh, internal limiting membrane flaps, and they tend to scroll, so we have some issues with that. But this one here, and again, part of the way to preventing is use the plurifluor carbon liquid and you slide it underneath, and it does really hold it down. It's a very elegant technique, and I'm, again, I'm very impressed with this, um, this idea. Again, very skeptical at first. It just, you know, it's just cutting off a piece of retina and putting it there, but it, it seems to work. David, <clears throat> is, there, is there any thought about using um, living relay, uh, not li a cadaveric retina in a case like this? Is there any danger to the area where you are 
uh, excising the patient's own retina to transplant, to do an auto transplant. So I guess the question is, can you use cadaveric retina <coughs> um, as just as tissue? It, it theoretically could be possible. I don't think I've had any or anybody I've heard has done that. Um, because you're always worried about uh, other problems with uh, cadaveric ones, um, including a rejection and stuff like that. Um, so they, they've just done the uh, togas. Um, the biggest risk is you're creating a hole. This one's easy again, because there was already a hole in the, uh, in the periphery. But when you're actually taking it from ATAS retina, that was the big concern. What would happen when you do laser it and if there's some issues um, with that? Um, it's interesting that the, also the comment is made to do it supranasally because there's, there is theoretically more cones in that zone versus a supratemporal and other or inferior temporal and nasal. Um, so there's more cones in that area and that may help. So hence the importance of the orientation, uh, Stefan has, has asked. Just we know the uh, the uh, from stem cell transplants, the highest success rates are the autologous ones. Yeah. Um, but still, you completely uh, bypass the concern about causing a retinal problem where you're taking the donor tissue uh, if you're using cadaveric tissue. Yeah, that's why one of the reasons we've actually. Uh, uh, Stanzo Rizzo uh, in Italy is starting started, uh, presented using amniotic membrane. Um, again, uh, using when we try to close these macular holes as a form of matrix to allow uh, glial cells to come in, that's the thought. Whereas this autologous retinal transplant may be more than just glial cells. There is something going on um, in, uh, with the actual tissue. And, uh, again, it's, it's surprising. The real thing that surprised me, Stefan, uh, Stefan uh, mentioned is, is the, the recreation of that fulvial depression which is really fascinating to me. Like, the, the, there's something going on there. That's that, it's intriguing with that. So we got to do a lot more work in that. Mm. Okay. Um, if that's the case, there are no more questions. I'm just going to really, uh, with the last probably 10 minutes, uh, so uh, present um, this whole concept. Of why we're talking is, is the visualization of of um, uh, and retina, which is really what has um, allowed us to do a lot of what we can do here. And so um, <clears throat> this is what I'm going to talk about is the vitrectomy visualization. And in essence, the old horizons, which we'll talk very quickly, and then what the new frontiers are, and what we are kind of looking forward uh, is the next transition that we'll do. And here's quickly my financial disclosures. And what the big issue is, is obviously with retina is this high corneal curvature, which really prevents us from looking at the back. And, you know, this has been resolved, as we know, in, in the office, you actually can see your the retina with the contact lens systems that you use. And, you know, as you can see the non-contact, the 78 or the 90 diopter, which we have all become familiar how to use. Uh, principle, and again, I'm not going to be... Uh, John here is probably much better and everybody else better than most retina people of understanding the optics, but then you get the direct visualization with these contact lenses. And then of course, with that is the field of view with these contacts. Um, and in the office, you use the contact lens and in the new operating room, uh, recently it was a contact lens system. So they would put uh, contact lenses to, to see the posterior segment. And many of us who trained uh, earlier, uh, remember this uh, great, device to irritate, uh, they called it irritating, but it was the irrigating contact lens where you'd put it on and, and you'd have an assistant. The advantage is you got this high resolution, but you required assistant and because it's irrigating, you got fluid everywhere and your, your scrubs and everything got wet because you had this fluid flowing everywhere. Um, other things that came up was the contact lenses uh, that didn't require irrigation. Um, and that was very helpful. The important thing is you had to have separate contact lenses for when you do it under fluid. And then when you went to air, you had to change that contact lens. And for the periphery, they had prisms. And so you'd, you'd operate through prisms and you'd be rotating this contact lens 360 degrees to see the peripheral retina, just much like you would use with a three mirror contact lens to see the peripheral retina. And that was a, quite a problem because you had to be very orientated. Um, so, 
this whole concept of panoramic or also known as wide angle visualization and where that concept started. And I think something we have to remember is it actually started and we should be uh, impressed uh, is actually St. Mike's in Toronto. And it was Mike Shea. Um, uh, Mike Shea was, is literally the, the, for many who don't know, is, is the father of vitro retinal surgery in Canada. And um, many of us uh, are, have been fortunate to be uh, uh, touched by his uh, education and stuff. Um, and, and he has set the precedence at St. Mike's. And with that, he, he Mike Shea uh, was talking with uh, one of the meetings and there's a gentleman named Manfred Spitznas in the audience who's a German um, retina specialist. And they took this concept further and saying, okay, can we go this with the indirect ophthalmoscopy, which they did, everybody was using that time. And they built this system and uh, Dr. Spitznas did with this thing called the biome. And, and we actually had at St. Mike's, and I have to find it via the Smithsonian versions one, um, which is this long black tube and then version three. But just like you do with the binocular indirect ophthalmoscopy or at the slit lamp biomicroscopy, everything's inverted. You can't operate it inverted. So they developed this stereoscopic diagnostic uh, diagonal inverter. They're called the SDI. And that turned everything upside down and back to normal uh, orientation. And this is today the biome uh, and the various ways it does. And the, the one on the right is quite interesting. It looks like a, uh, a lay. But again, you can see the 70 diopter, 90 and 110, and that's exactly what it is. It's essentially like your 90 diopter at the slow lamp. Uh, there's also a contact lens system. And then I was fortunate to be trained by uh, Dr. Chang and, and he was developing with this guy, Avi Grimblant, this concept. Uh, and there's a whole story behind this one, which we don't have time. And they developed this concept of contact lens panoramic viewing. And again, with a stereo inverter. And now uh, we, and most of us in the city, use this non-contact, which is, uh, I think, two of the centers, and KI uses the Zeiss, and another one uses uh, uh, the, the biome, which, you know, they're all fantastic, and they have this ability to see in the posterior segment. And essentially what it is, you can see there's this, this, this floating lens, like the 90 or 78 diopter, and by changing the distance, again, same thing as your slit lamp, you actually can focus the big difference between direct and panoramic is the advantage is the resolution. With the direct, you get much better resolution and the panoramic, you get excellent peripheral view. Um, and the nice thing about the panoramic is it's irrespective of the medium and you can use the panoramic viewing in both fluid and air, whereas in the direct, you have to use uh, separate lenses. And here's an example. This is actually the same patient, one on the your left there is the direct visualization with a contact lens. And on the right is the wide angle. And the, there's a slight color difference due to the, due to the color of the, the camera and the way it was done, but essentially you can see the difference in the view you can get. The panoramic visualization, I think, is the single biggest advancement in vitro retinal surgery. It's not even fluorofluorocarbon liquids, which uh, Dr. Chang developed. It's not the cutters, uh, the, the vitrectomy cutters that we have now. We can go on to now even 27 gauge. Those are micro increments. Panoramic viewing is probably the biggest thing. It allowed us to see everything at once and seeing all the relations of the vitreous and the retina and looking for things in the attachments and peripheral retinal neovascularizations and, and, and traction. And that's how we can look at that. And I think that's, one, in my opinion, the single biggest advancement in VR surgery. Well, and then I, I've skipped over the endoscopy, which uh, HETEM has done uh, very well at. Um, and, and, but I want to talk about the operating microscope and where the next advancements would be. And so this is your classic operating and you're at the microscope and you're using the ocular uh, parts of the optical system. But here's this new concept, which has came out a couple of years ago and, and several parts in the city have uh, the system and we have it at KI as well, is a 3D heads up surgery. And what is that? Well, essentially you look at a TV screen and in this large 55 inch uh, 3D TV screen. And then you're looking at this and no longer you're looking through an optical system, you're looking through a electrical camera system and you put it on 3D glasses. At, at St. Mike's, we actually have both systems. Uh, there are two systems on the market, one called Ingenuity and the other one is called uh, Artivo from Zeiss. And we have both of those. And you're essentially replacing the microscope oculars with a camera, a computer that's imaging and, and translating that, that um, image into a 3D monitor and use 3D glasses. 
The basics of 3D setup is very important and is the key to the whole situation. And here in the positioning, we have the monitors, one for the surgeon and we have other, uh, another monitor for somebody else who's not wearing the glasses. We have the scrub nurse here who sits on, on the side. The anesthetist is sitting in the back and it gets very crowded with all this instrumentation. And the scope is over here. And, and the important thing is this white balance that we're you can see in the top, it was not white balance and again, a green hue and where the bottom one is much better white balance, you can see, and this is the same patient uh, with just the, the difference in the balancing. Um, important is the distance from um, the surgeon and, and uh, it's been worked out to be roughly 1.5 meters, uh, four, uh, four feet in that zone uh, is very useful. And, and Dave Chow, Dr. Chow has been working on this very clearly with uh, the, uh, the industry people, what is the optimal uh, parameters for these 3D systems. Um, here, I'm just quickly gonna show, here's a system where we can do the peripheral retina using the wide field a panoramic system plus the uh, the the, the um, heads up display and you can get very good resolution and using less light here's the other system this is the zeiss system and you can see how sharp the pictures can be and this allows us to have very good visualization uh, with it um, i'm just going to show this is the membrane peeling that occurs and we can, we can it's maybe a little bit jaggedy on your system uh, the reviewing but see so slowly peel away and this is with a contact lens not with a panoramic wide fill and you can see there's a high resolution in seeing the planes of where we're dealing with with this uh, system um and so the advantages are um of these 3d heads up systems is all views are actually from the surgeon's viewpoint so everybody in the room can see what the surgeon is doing this is a fantastic device, a system to, for trainees when we're teaching uh, fellows and residents. Uh, they see exactly what we are, and there's a reduce in the misunderstanding of what we're looking at, and you can have ability to identify the tissues that you want to, to, to uh, operate on and look at. Uh, as for videos, it's, it's fantastic also to record because you're actually in focus, you know what you're looking at many times. If, Many of you have seen your recordings don't necessarily match what you optically see. And one of the things we've been working on is an enhanced vision uh, and where we can actually change and improve the vision with electronic uh, uh, stabilization with the computers and stuff. And as many of us as educators, uh, by looking at it and we watch, uh, it actually reduces the stress for us because we can actually know where the, uh, the, the our, our uh, trainees are working at and, and looking at very carefully. We can tell them what where to go uh, to do it. And for the fact that I sit around and I, I put my glasses on, I can walk around the room and then still uh, uh, direct the uh, fellow to do where to do the surgery. The last bit I want to touch about is intraoperative OCT. And and the nice thing is that Zeiss has this, and we, we're just we had, we've had it in the past and we're actually putting it back again. And, and I, know, I know Leica has a system and there's a, a third system uh, that can be done. Um, and so here's the intraoperative OCT on the left. You can see there on the right, you can see we just put some uh, catalog. And then here you can see uh, the whole thing all together. And it gives you some tissue planes to look at. This is just very quickly, you can actually do a recording at the same time. Uh, we're not, one thing I found is I'm not an iguana, so I have to keep my eye on the left to look at that and plane, and I can't use the OCT concurrently. And so um, it's more for just looking after planes afterwards, but we are working on a device where we can try to do it all at once. So one of the big questions, does an intraoperative OCT change management decisions? And there's various papers that looked at it and it can do it from anywhere from 12 to almost 50% may change your management decisions. So I think there's much more uh, things to learn from this uh, when we're using it. And important thing, does it predict outcomes? And, and one of the things in the macro hold, the residual fragments we see around the macro hold may indicate more limited vision in this. So this is something we're gonna try to confirm uh, from these other papers that have come out. Uh, and so in summary, I think just one of the things that and quickly go through this was that panoramic vision, the big advancement it did was it allows us to see outside the mac and seeing all the relations of, of the vitreal retinal surgery. Endoscopy is nicely uh, shown in that case. It really can bypass uh, that opaque anterior segment and we can see things that posterior the iris. And one of the things that we've seen in the past is also retain little lens material in, in those areas and take that out. 
I think 3D heads up surgery where this will be very important is increasing our, our resolution and, and what we see and helping us educate the next uh, uh, generation of surgeons uh, uh, and showing them. And intraoperative OCT, I think, is a very going to be interesting. And it's going to allow us to, like it does in the office now, is it allows us to see beyond our optical resolution. And I think we're just starting to understand this both for the posterior segment. I know the anterior segment surgeons at our institution are very excited in seeing how this works uh, for doing uh, their surgery. So with that, I want to thank you. And it was a brief presentation. And just the, 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 the process we've seen over time with uh, uh, vitro retinal surgery. Thank you. Any questions? <clears throat> Just amazing videos, David. It's really impressive uh, what uh, what you can see. I missed exactly when that biome came out. I feel like when I was a resident, it certainly wasn't present. What, what year did it switch over to biomes? Uh, the, the, so the whole concept, I remember, if I remember the story, it was around 1987, the late 80s. Uh, Mike Shea was one of the first, I think literally it came off the shelf and he was one of the first people that just bought that system he tried to make it in canada but of course are probably the same thing like anything it doesn't manufacture things very quickly uh, the germans very quickly jumped on it and so he just bought the first thing the first biome the original one was huge it was a long tube like this i still remember him using it and, uh yeah it was late 80s uh, and i when i trained was in the mid 90s uh, he was already fully functional with this thing david you you mentioned the ingenuity and the zeiss systems uh, how do the two systems compare, and is there one that gives you better visualization? Uh, excellent question, Jerry. We're, we're still working through some of that. Um, they both have their strengths and weaknesses. Um, the Ingenuity, one of the things that it has is very good is, is this HDR. It's uh, able to balance out the, the, the contrast uh, just much like your camera does. The Zeiss system doesn't have HDR, and it requires a little bit more fine-tuning. But the one thing that Zeiss does is it does more true coloring. So it, you have much more coloring that's more representative of, of what the tissue should look like. The ingenuity, uh, you can play around more with the coloring. So you can use that usefully. And I, I didn't show it. One of the things we do is we go through a color palette and we can change things and see it. We enhance our view. So we're appealing membranes. Some people like more yellowing coloring so we can actually see the edges better. Um, so I know Dr. Chow has been playing a lot with that, uh, seeing if we can enhance that uh, on these uh, 3D systems. But then the thing that's nice about the, uh, the Zeiss system it has the intraoperative OCT built in, which really, as you can see, uh, it's a nice little, for right now, it's a toy, but I think we're going to start learning to use it in its, its full uh, form. David, thank you for that talk. That was great. I guess one piece of feedback I have with the, the heads up systems and we have it at, i've used it at kensington is one of the purported benefits is potentially ergonomics but right now you have to look around the stack so i think that's probably one thing that the, that the companies need to work on and we probably need to feed back to industry is that if you're looking around the microscope stack it's still not uh, great for ergonomics it would be nice if we could look directly ahead but i do think um some of the other points are very valid especially for teaching you can actually walk up right to the screen and say do this do that because you often see in surgical videos the, the surgeon is using their cannula to tell residents what to do. Yeah. But, but now you can actually point exactly where you want them to go yeah. on the okay. screen, which is, which is really nice. Exactly. It seems, um, it seems to be much more posterior segment friendly than, than anterior segment friendly. Or what, do you, what do you think? Do you think that in time, uh, anterior segment surgeons will be looking at these systems? I think so. I mean, I, I, I do. I, I agree with you. I think there is... Um, there is an enhanced comfort level with the um, with the surgical microscope. The it's not quite the same with the heads up system, but I I'm optimistic that there's potential here, um, especially for, from an ergonomic standpoint. Yeah, one of the things is there's a there's a slight time lag, and you see this more with the anterior segment because you're moving much quicker. In the, in the posterior segment, we don't like to move very quickly, so we don't have that time lag. Um, you know, I, I fakoed with the, this and you can, uh, with the heads up, you can see a slight delay with more of the ingenuity. The Zeiss system doesn't have that, that delay because it doesn't have to um, do the HDR as much. There's not much translation going on in, in that. But the same thing is, is 
you know, I think it's a comfort level, as, as, as Amadeep has said. The other thing that's, that's also is it does take an extra few minutes to set up, move the screens in and out. And I think we have to learn how to figure that out. Um, I know some surgeons don't like it because it does slow it down slightly in the room. So, and David, there's a question here from Shabo. Um, going back to the macular hole, is the flap serving as a physical barrier or is it functionally integrated into the macula? Uh, excellent question. We first thought it was a physical barrier, but I think many of us now think that there's probably a functional because of this negative scotoma type uh, release. And the second thing is you just start to see it integrating into the tissue, which is, again, fascinating uh, uh, on that. Okay, and then one more question. This, this, uh, we got some history buffs here. So uh, Michael Henry is asking uh, if Mark Shermer played it's a Kirk, role. It's Kirk, Kirk Shermer. And Kirk so Shermer, Mark I'm Henry, sorry. Uh, Michael Henry is totally correct. So it, it can. So how this history, and maybe for the last minute here. So the actual thing was Kurt Shermer wanted to start with this with a, a photography. Wanted to say, can we make a photography system to have a kind of panoramic view? Because uh, back then you couldn't. So he came to Mike Shea, and, and Kurt from and, and Montreal came over and I talked to Mike Shea, and then Mike, Dr. Shea said, well, let's think about this from surgery. And so that's where Kurt. Uh, push this to Mike Shea to think about putting, and Mike Shea thought about doing surgery. And of course, they, when the biome actually came out, Kirk was kind of all up, um, uh, upset about this because uh, it was their idea. And so he sent this stuff, this prototype they're working on, down to New York to uh, uh, Yale Fisher, and uh, no, to, to Larry Yanuzzi, sorry, Larry Yanuzzi. And Larry Yanuzzi um, doesn't do surgery, so he gave it to his partner, Yale Fisher. Yale Fisher was having um, some. Uh, personal issues and, and meaning that he just didn't have time to deal with this and just threw this into the washroom and along walked around Avi Grimblant who kind of visits the area picked this up saw this idea and then that's how he developed the the contact lens system so that's that little story how that all link is, links together so Kurt was the one who actually started the process of photography and then Mike Shea thought about surgery. Well David I can tell you this between optics and history in your talk I think you made John Lloyd's day <laughs> As we get older, history becomes more important. <laughs> That's right. So thank you for the round. I'll let John close it out. Yeah. So that was that was fabulous, guys. Thank you very much for that. So thanks to David uh, Hatem and Safwan. Great presentations and uh, really fascinating videos. Amazing videos uh, to see that uh, what you do there. So uh, just a quick reminder to everybody that it is the uh, EPSO. Um, I position the Surgeons of Ontario annual general meeting tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. So for those uh, watching who are faculty, if you haven't already received the invite, you need to reach out to Marsha Kim at EPSO to, uh, to get your invite link for the meeting tomorrow at 10 a.m. An important meeting, um, some big changes going on in our, our field. Um, and uh, one more thing for the residents, I just want to speak with you guys briefly. So I'm going to join into the resident teaching link for a few minutes right after this. So I'll, I'll speak to you guys then. Uh, thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you.